Well, good morning once again, everybody. It is awesome to be with you. You see that uh, we are using a handheld mic today, so try not to be distracted by that. I'm actually really comfortable using them because of work and everything, but anyways, it's good to be together in God's house. Um, I wanted to share a story with you guys this morning because the message today is uh, titled The Way of Humility. And it's a two-part message. Um, this week, we are going to be talking about um, one piece. Next week, the other piece. And um, I wanted to share with you a story in starting this series. So some of you have heard this if you're in my Sabbath school class. But a few weeks ago, um, I had a situation at work where um, I was tested and failed pretty miserably. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, but what happened was uh, a friend of mine who is there at the office, um, I'm just going to call them they, uh, they made a couple comments to me as I was on my way out of the office, and I had worked this this really kind of tough week, some late nights, some early mornings, stuff like that, um, but they hadn't seen this, and so they decided to give me kind of a hard time about not being there in the office and about being gone or like leaving to do something. And I became very uh, just defensive about that. And it's just an issue for me. It just is with work and like I want people to think that I work hard and that I'm not lazy and that kind of, so when, when somebody says something like that, I, I like a snake, you know, just <laughs> like the guard goes up and it's like, uh-oh, not good. And so I knew that and even my other friend, he said, oh boy. That's not good. So I made a few comments back the other direction um, to that to that friend that were just really nasty and and mean spirited and not not good at all. So on my way out of the office, um, it's like I hadn't gotten those words off my tongue, and I was like, ugh, just the Holy Spirit just like pierced my heart, and I felt that. You know what I'm talking about? That tugging, that conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I felt it, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm, I just, I'm not going to be able to live with this. I'm going to have to make it right. Like, it's just, it's going to pester me forever if I don't. So I went, and I, I made it right, with as right as it can be made, you know, apologize to that person. Uh, also to everyone else who was in the room, because I made it, like, really awkward and uncomfortable for everybody. But in that situation, you know, my pride really got the best of me. Pastor Letty did a, a series relatively recently called The Poison of Pride. And ever since then, I've been thinking, how do you do this? <laughs> like, how do you overcome this monster? C.S. Lewis wrote about pride a lot. And he said that pride is the, like, it, every single sin can be boiled down to pride. Every one of them. And so it, it truly is a monster for us. It just, it lives within me and, and within all of us. It's a, it's a real challenge. And the more I focus on my pride, how do I overcome this? How do I overcome this? It's like the more frustrated I get. And I've been really struggling with this. And um, it's funny because um, I, I heard an analogy. And it was, if, if you tell somebody, okay, don't think about a black cat. Don't think about how it purrs and how it walks with its back all arched and its fuzzy little tail and, and how you like to pet it and you give it some milk. Don't think about a black cat. Whatever you do, don't. And then what are you thinking about? A black cat. And it's like the more I focus on my pride and my arrogance and like how do I fix this, it's like I, f I feel like just the more I realize that it's just such a problem. How do I overcome this? Um, does that resonate with you guys? Am I just pushing? Okay, all right, cool, cool. Um, I love what Pastor Letty said, and I don't know if this was her quote or if it came from somewhere else. I've been trying to see if I can find it, and I haven't been able to find it, so I think it was her quote. But she said this a couple weeks ago in her series, um, um, Count the Worshippers. She said, when I look at myself, I think, how can I possibly be saved? But then I look at Jesus, and I say, how can I possibly be lost? And that is just one of the greatest, I feel like that statement just, it just encompasses the heart of repentance. It's like, I look at myself, and I say, how? Why? I don't, I, 
But then I look at Christ and I say, wow, Lord, how could I be lost? You, the God of everything with life within yourself, laid down everything for me. It's, it's just beautiful. So I found this principle to be true in the very deepest of ways. And I used to preach about it because I thought it to be true. And I'm just realizing more and more just that I, I just know this truth for myself. Um, and it is that we cannot live by constantly um, looking at ourselves, trying to fix ourselves. Looking at ourselves and the sin inside of us, because this is part of repentance, right? It really does no good unless we almost immediately look to Christ. Um, so the Lord put this message on my heart, and uh, I said, Lord, how can I preach a message called the way of humility? Because I'm not humble enough to do that. How do you preach on humility if you're not humble? So this is something that I've just been working on in myself and just trying to, trying to understand. And I feel like he told me, he said, you're right. So don't preach on yourself. <laughs> preach about me. And so that's what I'm going to do this morning. Um, if it's all the same to you, that's what I would like to do. So I want you to know as we start this little two-week series that I stand before you as a student of the Bible, but God is the author of the word. I stand before you as a work in progress, but he is the one who is faithful to complete every good work within us. Amen? I stand before you as just a speck of dust, like a puny little insignificant speck in the scope of God's universe, but God has a way of making diamonds out of dust. I'm a, a, a wayward son, but God is in the habit of bringing prodigals home. Amen? All right, so if it's all the same to you this morning, I'm going to preach on Christ's humility, not mine. Um, we've been talking about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, a lot lately. Um, and just in general, we, we had it up here with a, a box of rocks. And we would, sometimes we take a rock during our prayer time, and we think about the things that are keeping us from the Lord. Because this passage uh, in Hebrews says, Let us run with endurance the race set before us, and let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And, and we've really been focusing on that. So I want to look at this morning Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the very following verse, okay? And I'm going to read this from New American Standard. Um, I really like the way that it's written there. Um, but you can follow along with me if you'd like. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles. This is, this is from verse 1. And let us run endur with endurance the race that's set before us. Now we get to verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I just got to say this, man, this verse is so awesome because I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life I feel like, like my faith is just so weak, like it's, like it's incomplete, like, like I know what I want to do, but I struggle sometimes to just believe that what God says is right for me to do is really the best way, or that the situation that I'm in, to believe that he really can be, can be working good in it. Sometimes our faith is just so weak. I love this verse because it says that Jesus Christ is the author of, and the perfecter of our faith, meaning that he created faith. He authored faith. He wrote it. He's the designer of it. He lived by faith himself, and he's the perfecter of it, meaning he's not going to leave us where we're at. 
He's not going to leave us where we are. He will perfect our faith. He, he is faithful to complete a good work in us that as time goes on, he's moving us towards that last day where he will eradicate the sin nature from us completely and our faith will be made complete in him just like Christ's faith was so perfect and complete. Is that not awesome? So let's, let's take it back a few thousand years and look at Christ's birth. So Jesus, in, in 3 B.C., Jesus is born. And if you're wondering about why 3 B.C., go on our website and check out Sandy's study on God's clocks. And she looks at the 70 weeks from Daniel chapter 9. A really awesome study. But you can see how we can really know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was born in 3 B.C. Anyways, um, <laughs> Jesus is born in 3 B.C. And his birth is like this incredibly humble event, right? Like, none of the world even blinked. The day came where, where Jesus, he wasn't here in physical form, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, and now he's here, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all things. Every living thing is alive because of his breath in its lungs, and he takes physical form upon his creation. One of the most just cataclysmic, incredible events of all of history. And his, his own people, Israel, just sleep through the night. Nobody, nobody's there. The wise men, they come later. But the shepherds, the only attendees, the outcasts of society, smelly, stinky, the job that nobody wants, they're the ones that the angel tells to come. They're his, his welcome party. Born to this husband, wife, just menial, nobody, nobody special, nobody significant. In the message that I shared back in December called Roots of Redemption, we talked about the lineage of Christ and just the humble place that Jesus came. I mean, kings like Manasseh and some of the most wicked people in Israel's history are in the line of Christ, are in his bloodline. What kind of God is this that we serve? Why would he choose to come in this, in this form, in this way, from this line of people? In, in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, You, Bethlehem Ephrathah, are, although you are the, the least among all of the clans of Judah, out of you will come a ruler, an anointed one. So he's born into the lowest of tribes of Israel. I mean, Literally nothing about Christ is anything but humble. And he lived his whole life this way. Uh, it's funny, John chapter 9, verse 29, the Pharisees, they come to Jesus, and he's speaking with all of this authority, right? And, and they're not really able to, to counter that authority. And so they come up to him, and they say, all right, look, we know Moses was from God and stuff like that, and he spoke with God's authority because we know where he came from, but who are you? And they, they talk to Christ, and, and they even tell him it's like, if we were to use a not-so-pleasant or um, acceptable word today, they, they told him that his parents were never married, essentially. They said, you, you, can't, you can't speak for God. You're nobody special. Look, you were born t out of a... Out of a uh, relationship that wasn't even in the marriage covenant. Your parents weren't even married when you were conceived. So how can you talk to us? We're the Pharisees. So they use his own humble birth against him to try to, to tear him down and to rationalize you know, their, own, their own thinking and refusal to, to come into repentance. So Christ's birth, just one of the most incredibly humble events. Then Jesus comes, right, and his life. Everything about it, Luke chapter 9, verse 58, said the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He was homeless. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say, He became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And the depth of that verse is like a whole study. It's not just talking about, you know, physical wealth. It's talking about he became poor in every way. He he had nothing. He even, even the presence of God was taken from him. He had nothing. 
so that we might become rich in his presence. Inc- incredible. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 says he lived his life in, in, in agony with loud cries and tears. It's not a life of comfort, not a life of luxury. And I wanted to get to Isaiah 53 here for a minute. So if you'll turn with me here to Isaiah 53, I think, man, probably no passage really touches on the humility of Christ the way that this one does. And I want to start here because as you're turning to Isaiah 53, this week we're talking about Jesus and his life and his death, his birth, and what that looked like and who it shows him to be. Because here's the thing. At the beginning of time, Satan had an accusation against God. God created Lucifer, and Lucifer said, God, you don't really have our best interests at heart. You don't really love us. You're really kind of just a dictator, a tyrant. And if we don't do what you say, you're just going to kill us. What kind of, what what do you mean you're a God of love? And so he starts breeding these, uh, this deception and this doubt amongst all of the angels, and God allows this to happen. And so my point, we're going to get to a lot of that next week as we talk about creation and then when Christ returns and who he is. But as we're looking at, at this and Christ's humility and his life here on earth, that's what I want us to really hone in on is the fact that Jesus does this for many reasons. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they have this plan. And the plan is to illustrate to you and I who they are. Because there's been a lot of accusations hurled at God. Even you and I sometimes accuse God, how can God be good if this is happening? I'm, you know, in our confusion, in our turmoil, in our stress, in, our, in our, the struggle, in our pain, our afflictions, you know, we can question who God is. So if I can put it really, really simply, I mean, the whole Bible into just a phrase, if that's even possible, God is trying to illustrate to all of creation for all time, who he really is. And in doing that, he's going to secure the kingdom for us forever. Because who will be able to challenge him after this? After this display of love, after this display of humility, who will question his character? Who will question his judgment? And if they do, who will side with them? You see what I'm saying? If this were to happen again and, and, and some kind of angel or, or creation or some new creation were to rebel, how many of us are going to jump on the bandwagon the way that the demons did with Lucifer? It's just not going to happen. And that is how God is securing the kingdom forever and ever. And not just that, but he's doing what is so amazing, what only God can do. It's taking something and then, and then it, was, it was hurt. It was made, it was made bad. Some, something, something terrible happened to it. Perfect creation was brought low because of the curse of sin. And he's going to restore it to better than it was at the beginning. Only God can do that. I mean, I can't think of any examples in this life of something that's it's made in the beginning, it's new, and then it's, it's taken down, and then it's restored to be better than it originally was. It's just, it is just an incredible thing that the Lord is doing among us, and he's doing it by, by trying to show us who he really is and his humility. Okay, so let's read here Isaiah 53. I want to read some of this passage. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence. So this is talking about Jesus here. Grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. Now get the second half of this verse. I mean, I just, wow. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. You guys have seen all, all these Jesus movies, right? There's like, there's so many, you know, there's the passion and there's son of God and there's all these, and Jesus is like a model, like, whoa, this is a, this is a good looking guy. And 
it just goes so contrary. Obviously, you're trying to sell movie tickets. It makes sense to do that. But it goes so contrary to what Scripture says about who Jesus was, that there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing, not a thing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own way. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Wow. I've thought many times about this verse, and since I've kind of come into uh, an understanding, I think, of more truth of Scripture, when, when, I, when I kind of left the, the, the place of wanting to just be religious, just go to church, just be a part of a denomination, and I started to value the Word of God and what it said, and I wanted to know what it said, and I wanted to know why it said it, and I come into this, this new place of studying God's Word, and I, start, and I start wondering these questions, right? Like, if the wages of sin is death, why did Jesus have to suffer in this way? Why couldn't God just, why couldn't God just take his life, why the beating? Why the torture? When they ripped out his beard, when they spit on him, when they lash him, when they put him on the cross to suffer in anguish and gasp for breath for hours and hours, bleeding on a tree that he created. Why? Why is that necessary? Isn't the wages for sin death? You see where I'm going? And we start thinking about these questions. Now, wait a second. Why, why was that? God doesn't do things that are not necessary. In God's government, he says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound, a bruise for a bruise. He is the perfect accountant. Everything is right. Everything is fair. Everything is just. He doesn't extract payment more than what is owed. He's perfectly fair, perfectly balanced. So why then does Christ have to suffer so greatly if all that is due is death. And I started thinking a lot about this, and, and I realized more and more about this principle that is kind of lacking in our justice system today because it's just not a perfect system, is called restitution. And restitution is the, is the idea that there's, there's a certain payment beyond just what the crime was so for example if if someone um, were to murder another person and then they get the death penalty and then they're killed can that penalty possibly recover the loss of a child a brother a husband a son i mean think about the impact of when a life is taken all the people that it affects the grief, people are thrown into depression, people are thrown into anger, rage against God. God, how could you let this happen? All of this caused from the choice to take a life. So when that person's life is then taken, so they, they pay, you know, for the crime that they did, it's equal, right? But is it really equal? How can, how can that justice be extracted? Death is not enough. That's what hell is for. It's called restitution. Restitution. And the Bible teaches this. So, so get this. We can talk about that another time. Sanctuary study. Different topic. But what I'm trying to get at here is that Christ paid the restitution for the redeemed. The price for sin was death. So if he were just to pay the price for sin, then he just dies. Very simply, very painlessly. It could be, it could be not as dramatic as it was. But because you and I owe restitution for our sins, the things that we do that have to be paid for and fixed. Let's read this again. He was pierced for our transgressions. 
bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The humility of Christ goes beyond just just his own, you know, humbling and lowering and submission of himself. It's, it's looking towards you and I for our best interests, for what will make us whole. I'm going to finish reading this section. Verse 7, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal and put in a rich man's grave. Wow. Wow. I mean, I feel like I feel like I'm really ripping through this because each one of these points, each one of these verses in Isaiah 53 is like just so so huge. And I just encourage you, my my point this morning isn't to just walk through every little speck of how what how Christ was humble, every situation where he showed humility. I mean, that wouldn't even be possible. It would take forever. My point is to direct you towards this simple truth, that if we desire humility, if we value humility, if we want to be like Christ, if we, if we believe what we say we believe, that he is good, that he is, he is holy, he is faithful, he is true, that he is our God, and we want to be obedient to that, then that means that we're going to be seeking humility. And in doing that, you know, because that's, that's, that's what I want to be. That's who I want to be. And I feel like I'm not that person. And so in my life, I'm res- I wrestle with that. And the, what I have found is the only way to be successful in that endeavor is to look to our Savior, is to look to Jesus, is to look how he acted, what he did, what he said, how he conducted himself in situations And that's why I want this verse to be kind of our mantra for the next couple weeks, Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's read a little bit here from John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And, I mean, this has to be the most beautiful prayer in the Bible. Probably followed by Daniel chapter 9. Daniel's prayer, in my opinion, right, right on the heels of this. But, I mean, what makes this so incredible is that it's Jesus saying these words. And I want to read some of this. John chapter 17. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that he can give glory back to you. I mean, in his request (laughs) for the Father to glorify him, which is a glory that he deserves, that he just innately deserves because he exists as divinity. He deserves glory. He's requesting it so that he can give it back to the Father. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I've revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. Now, he's... This is the hour before Jesus is going to be arrested, before he's about to go to the cross and suffer the utmost agony, anguish, and loneliness that anyone in history will ever feel. More suffering than could ever be calculated. 
And who is he praying for? He's praying for his disciples. And more than that, he's praying for you and I. Let's keep reading here. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me. So they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. That is so profound right there. He wants us to be united as the Father and the Son are united. Wow. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in in the world so that they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. And he continues, continues praying for his disciples, and he gets down to verse 20. And get this. This is just astounding. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. In the hours before Christ went to the cross, he was praying for you and for me. How can that be? Who is this God that we serve? What what a display of humility. Shortly after this, Jesus has taken... uh, to be tried in the night, uh, which was not in line with the law. So he's secretly tried in the night. Um, He's taken before Pilate because the Jews were not permitted to execute anyone. So he goes before Pilate, and as Isaiah 53 said, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he, he did not defend himself. He did not say a word. Like a criminal, he was beaten and tormented, spat upon, hit in the face, mocked. They would they would hit him and say, prophesy to us, Messiah, which one of us hit you? They mock him while he's on the cross. If you're the son of God, come down from there. I mean, how many of us <laughs> would just would just remain and not defending ourselves? I mean, he had all the power. He could have just just leveled that entire hill and come off of the cross in glory with tens of thousands of angels around him. I mean, all the while, he was able to be successful in this because of his humility, because he knew he didn't need to defend himself, because he saw a higher calling than what he would choose for his own life. He looked to the Father's will, not to his own will. And the fact that he would be nailed to a tree, a tree that he created, man, that's just been on my mind this week. Like, he crafted that tree. He watched it grow, knowing that it would be cut down and used as a crucifix to, for him to be executed on. I mean, I just, wow. If If we can't... Open God's word, especially looking at Christ, and sit down and and contemplate and meditate on these things and be moved by this display. There's, there's nothing like this. We will never find an example like this in all of history, in all of creation. There is nothing like this, and it should move us to the depths of our souls and that should should stir us because it's not natural to desire humility. It's totally foreign. It is just totally, I mean, how many of us have mastered this? It is, it's not possible. The only way for us to begin seeking God in this way is to look at Christ. So I guess this morning, the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, do we value humility is it is it something that we see in a person that we envy we see that and we say wow man that person the experiences they must have walking with the lord to respond 
so humbly in that situation when they're being berated, when they're being accused, when they're being made fun of, when they're being attacked for their faith or for this or that, to respond in that way, man, they must walk with the Lord. I want that. I want that experience. Or do we like the sound of it when we're at church? We like the sound of the word humility, but then during the week, we see it as kind of weakness. You know, humble person, uh, they're getting all walked all over, you know. And we, and we see it as weakness. The way of humility is challenging. That's why I like the series image, and we don't have the screens on right now, but um, if you're watching the video back, you can see that. The way of humility, it's a, it's a road. Oh, we saw it earlier on the screens. It was kind of playing through. It's a, it's a dusty desert road with kind of mountains on either side. It's in a valley, and it goes, and you can't see where it's going. It just turns, and, and it's too difficult to see. And I really like that image because... I look at Christ's life, and he's the epitome of humble. And it's a lonely road. It's challenging to constantly be scorched by the heat of the curse of sin, going to battle against your own prideful heart over and over again. And somebody says something, and that pride wells up, and you want to lash out, and you have to restrain it by keeping your eyes on Christ. I say, no, I look to Christ, how he act in this situation. It's discouraging sometimes to, to look at a disgraceful past and an uncertain future. You know, our future is being written as we make our choices, as we choose whether or not we want to be in the faith, whether we want to study God's word or not, whether we want to look to him as our example or not. But any road walked with Christ is going to be well worth it and is going to be a blessing. He walks in the way of humility. He always has and he always will. I want to be like that. I want to walk in that type of humility. Next week, we're going to take a closer look at just that, um, the way of humility, and we're going to look at Christ as Jesus as the creator in, that, in the beginning and as the king of kings in the end. And I'm really looking forward to being able to talk about this and tie what we know so much about Jesus from the Gospels and what they show about his life and from the Old Testament and different places. And so it is awesome to look at who he is as creator in the beginning and who he is going to reveal himself to be in the end as king of kings and lord of lords, almighty God. But until then, let us continue to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen.